name is Ron Aglash. I'm a professor of science technology studies with a courtesy appointment in computer science. So my main department, science technology studies, looks at um, the relationship between society uh, and things like engineering or chemistry, the way that something like uh, uh, pesticides, for example, get uh, created in a lab. And you might think, well, the chemist just figures out which pesticide is best to spray in the crops, and that's that. But what actually happens is the chemist's boss says, you need to make a pesticide that we can make lots and lots of money off of. So make it a broad spectrum pesticide that kills everything. Then it has bad environmental effects. So what uh, my department of science technology does, and, and everybody in science technology studies, uh, is try to look at the downside of, of science, the damage that it causes, uh, and then think about ways to uh, improve that. If you look in uh, something like the old uh, Time Life book on mathematics, kind of a, a popular presentation of mathematics, they'll have something like the history of mathematics in China that includes uh, the abacus, which was originally from Japan. They'll have the history of mathematics in Europe, which includes things like calculus. And then if they talk about Africa or, or Native American society, they'll say something like, uh, oh, these people know how to count to 10 on their fingers. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, colonial uh, look at these other cultures viewed through a, a Western lens. So I was very interested in thinking about um, how mathematics might look viewed through the culture's own uh, way of thinking about the world. And uh, I was very interested in, in fractal geometry just because I like math and I think fractals are cool. Um, let's take a look at this screen over here. So uh, around 1877, a guy named George Cantor made the first fractal. And he just took this little uh, triangular bump here um, and replaced every line in that shape with that little bump. So this flat line here becomes a line with a bump. And this diagonal line here becomes a line with a bump. Um, and so on throughout the figure. And then he did that again. So we can see this little line is, now has a little bump, and so on down. So every repeat, every iteration, as we say, um, gets more and more crinkled as you go. So uh, Cantor concluded that the um, uh, uh, total length of, of such a curve would be infinite, because the smaller you shrink down the ruler, the, the larger the curve size goes. Um, and you can see that here. So for example, if you had a ruler that was six inches long, um, you would miss all the little nooks and crannies. So as you shrink your ruler size down, you get more and more length that you're measuring. And uh, mathematicians thought that was very strange and that we really shouldn't talk about these weird uh, counterexamples to normal mathematics. Up until the, around 1977, when uh, French mathematician Benoit Mandelbrot discovered that nature has a fractal geometry. So nature has the, that kind of crinkliness uh, at many different levels. So that's the state of fractal geometry when, when I got interested in it. And like I said, I was very interested in non-Western cultures. But at the, the time, those were just two completely separate things. Um, but one day, I happened to be looking at um, an aerial photograph of some traditional African villages and I noticed that they look like fractals. This particular one is in rectangles. Uh, and you can see it's rectangles within rectangles within rectangles. And if we, um, if we zoom down into that central building here, this is the palace of the chief, um, you can see those rectangles continue to very small scales. And so the first thing I did was use some software uh, to do the same thing George Cantor did back uh, 150 years ago. So I, I start with a, a seed shape and then I replace parts of that with itself, uh, and that gets more and more crinkly, and so we end up with something that looks pretty much like that shape. So when I first started writing about this, I was saying, well, just like nature has fractals in uh, trees, you know, as a branch of a branch of a branch, or a cloud as a puff of a puff of a puff, uh, Africans were building villages that had the same kind of, of uh, fractal structure to it, uh, a structure that's sometimes called self-similar, because small parts are similar to the whole. Then I got a uh, Fulbright, uh, where I could just travel around Africa for a whole year interviewing people and asking them why they were 
uh, building these fractals. And uh, I was thinking of this as sort of kind of a, a unconscious bottom-up process, but they were very conscious of it. In fact, the um, palace of the chief here, they have a, a, a royal symbol, which is a rectangle inside of a rectangle inside of a rectangle, which you can see here. Um, and when you take a path through the palace, um, first you go through this corridor and then this one, the corridors get smaller and smaller as you spiral in towards the central throne. So they're actually using these um, fractals for, for practical purposes, kind of mapping them onto social structures. Um, and it's not just for rectangular structures like that, uh, you can also get them for circular structures. So here's kind of a, a, a ring-shaped village. Uh, you can see here's a small ring with uh, the, the one house for people and a kind of enclosure where you keep the animals. Uh, and this is a, a ring of rings. So here you can see all the little granaries um, and the uh, animals would be out here. The human habitation is here. And then the village as a whole has that ring of ring of rings structure to it. And here in the center where the human house would be for the single corral, the royal family is. And within that there's a smaller ring where the chief's immediate family is. And just uh, outside of that is a very, very tiny village, um, only about three feet big. Now you might ask, how can people fit in a village that's only three feet long? Um, but those are spirit people. So uh, that, that, that recursion, that, that uh, uh, iterative uh, loops of loops of loops, making things smaller and smaller, just goes all the way down through uh, your ancestral line for these villages. So it's a really beautiful, uh, uh, very cultural representation of what we mean by a fractal. So I was very excited about this. I thought um, this will be a great way to, to get this information out to the world, that there's this sophisticated uh, mathematical idea uh, in Africa. And I wrote this book called African Fractals. And at this point, I thought my job is now done, because now I, I've, I've found this uh, very sophisticated form of uh, mathematical and computational thinking uh, in traditional uh, African societies, and I've written a book about it. Now we can have uh, fractals in the classroom. But when I went to mathematics conferences and I asked uh, teachers about this, they said, well, uh, yeah, I have lots of, of African-American students in my classroom. Um, they're doing poorly in my class, but they don't know anything about Africa. They're not interested in Africa. That's just a bunch of dusty museum artifacts to them. So I asked them, well, out of all the examples in the book, um, what do you think the kids would respond to the best? And they said, well, um, the best example from the book would be your cornrows example. That's, that's uh, part of those African fractals that made it through the Middle Passage that, that is here, still here in the, uh, in the U.S. So uh, that was one of the first uh, uh, simulations we put up on the web, something that the kids could mess around with. And um, here you have our, our latest version of this. Um, so if we can look over at the screen here a second, um, so here's our little cornrows simulation. And uh, if I wanted uh, more of those little plaits, little twists that make up the braid, say uh, 200 instead of 15, uh, I just say repeat 200 times. Um, and I've got it turning by 6 degrees here, but I could turn by um, a higher number. Let's say I turn 7 degrees each time. And so it's really fun. You know, you can kind of uh, reverse engineer the algorithms that are, are in uh, uh, cornrows braiding. Now if you go into a, a braiding salon and uh, you ask the person there what algorithm are you using, they'll look at you like you're insane. Uh, I know because I've tried that myself. Um, but if you talk to them for a while you'll find out that in fact they are using algorithms. They do have a, a set of, of principles or rules. Uh, uh, you know often they'll say well this is all just intuition, I don't think about it. But if you talk to them long enough uh, you, can, you can find those, those rules. And the neat thing about this is that kids can then come in and they can, um, they can modify the algorithm. So, so let's, uh, uh, instead of just that one single braid, um, we can do multiple braids. And we can uh, throw in a little color there and have the braids change color as you go down. So um, we now have a website with uh, not just African materials, but also Native American, Latino, uh, a lot of different uh, cultural sources, even, even sort of um, 
uh, uh, sort of street culture. So we've got some examples. Uh, let's see here. Let me go to our website here. Uh, so here's an example that's uh, simulating graffiti. Um, and so the kids are still tapping into sort of the underlying mathematical principles here. Um, so you're using uh, logarithmic spirals and, and uh, uh, arcs of circles and, and other geometric ideas the same way that the uh, graffiti operator uses it. Um, and uh, you're kind of reverse engineering again the, the algorithm that the, is in the head of the uh, graffiti artist uh, who came up with it. As I was saying, um, one of the things that I was bothered about was that when people talk about the mathematics of China or the mathematics of, of Europe, um, they would talk about it in very sophisticated terms, but when they talk about math in uh, traditional African society or Native American society, um, it, it was always made to sound like it was very rudimentary. Um, and we know that all minds are universal. All, all minds are basically the same, built out of the same brains, built out of the same DNA. You know, there's very little genetic difference between um, one so-called racial group and, and another. Um, and so I knew it wasn't the case that some people were sort of uh, innately uh, uh, mentally inferior to another. Um, granted, different cultural situations put different demands on your brain. So somebody growing up in a culture that, that doesn't have any need for, um, for example, accounting principles and, and how to, how to, to, to juggle uh, multiple accounts and transfer money from one place to another um, probably isn't going to develop a mathematics that reflects that. But they will develop other kinds of math. And, and so really it was a question of asking um, what kinds of math are we missing out on? Um, what, what kinds of mathematics uh, do, we, do we need to uh, show that are kind of in a blind spot as uh, Brian Callahan, my student who was just in here, often says. So uh, this is a, uh, a little game uh, kind of like soccer that's played in Malaysia. Um, and uh, these balls are woven from natural reeds. Um, but you can see they're, they're woven in a very geometric style. Um, and that's actually uh, isomorphic, the same geometric structure that you would find in nanotechnology, in, in buckyballs. Um, and in fact, you can find these kind of hexagonal weaves in uh, African cultures and um, Native American cultures as well. So there, there's beautiful math to be found in these different cultures. And then the, the, the question is, you know, how do you take advantage of it? So uh, turning that into a book and getting that out to teachers was one way to do it. Um, creating these simulations is another. Um, but you can, you can take it even farther than that. There we go. So um, on the screen over here, you can see these uh, uh, symbolic shapes. Uh, this is the Sankofa symbol, the Jiname symbol. Um, these are shapes that you find in a cloth tradition called a dinkra in West Africa. And the reason it has these, these lovely curves to it is that the dinkra artisans are uh, taking structures that they observe in nature um, and then using that as the geometric structure for a symbol which has a little moral that sort of reminds you of that object. So for example, um, this uh, horn of, the, of the, the ram, the uh, ram's horn here is the logarithmic spiral. Um, and if you'll notice the um, stamp that they use here has that pair of, of uh, spirals on it. Um, so the particular symbol of the, uh, the ram's budding heads uh, is a symbol representing the idea that uh, if you're bullying somebody, if you're using aggression for no reason, um, you're struggling in vain. There, there's no point to it. Um, so in a, in a sense, the, the, um, the Adigra artisans are mathematicians too, right? They're modeling nature with the, these beautiful logarithmic curves. Um, when we got to the uh, uh, place in West Africa where folks were creating these um, creating these structures. So when we got to uh, Ghana and started talking with the folks who uh, make these designs, we found that they were taking uh, tree bark to make the ink. Uh, they would shred up the tree bark and then they'd boil it for a really long time. You can see a, a photo of that on the screen over here.
So here they're making their um, uh, tree bark ink and it's burning up um, a lot of wood and so it's putting a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere which is a greenhouse gas. Um, it's breaking their budget because they have to buy the firewood and now a lot of the, the forests have been stripped of wood um, which causes desertification. You know, uh, things that used to be forests, once you remove the trees, they start turning into deserts. So uh, we um, started working on this solar apparatus that would create um, ink using solar heat rather than the, the wood fire. Um, and so we're not only doing the, the ethnomathematic side, the, the, the ethnocomputing side of um, trying to look at these symbols and, and use them mathematically, but we're also trying to think about how do we help out folks um, in terms of economy, um, you know, there's a lot of health hazards from all the burning smoke, uh, all the, the smoke the fire produces, um, and so helping out in, in, in terms of health. My um, wife happens to be a uh, graphic designer, and so she was very interested in the problem of um, HIV in Africa. And so we uh, worked with the artisans to create some stamps that would be HIV prevention stamps. This is the traditional Sankofa symbol, um, but you notice the, the, the bird is holding a, a little condom in his beak. So the, the traditional saying that goes with Sankofa, you can always go back, um, we changed that too, you can always go back for a condom. Um, so it was reminding people to uh, uh, use uh, safe sex practices, and then um, because folks were a little bit embarrassed about buying condoms, we started working on condom vending machines. And so here you can see the um, the traditional cloth and the stamps are, are the cover of a machine. Um, so working on uh, issues in, in uh, uh, economy, trying to make sure that, that folks have enough uh, money, that they're not spending all their money on, on uh, wood for the fires, uh, working on uh, HIV prevention, that can all be done within that uh, indigenous knowledge system. So uh, you can move all the way from ethnomathematics to ethnocomputing to sort of uh, ethno health or ethno economy, if you want to think about it those ways. I remember when I first started looking at uh, fractals in African design, and I had never gone to Africa before. So all I had was these um, uh, aerial photographs of uh, villages that looked like fractals to me. And so I was, I was taking these to some professors in mathematics, and um, most of them were, were very negative about it. They'd say, well, you know, if you want to study computing and mathematics, you can do that. And if you want to study anthropology and culture, you can do that. Um, but you can't be in two different professions at the same time. Um, so I was very disappointed about uh, how they were looking at it. Um, and then also uh, some folks on the, on the culture side uh, were very dubious that this kind of analysis was going to help anybody. They'd say, well, uh, you know, science has been dissecting Africa for a long time, and so all you're doing is sharpening the blade. You know, you're not really offering us uh, something that can help liberate people. You're just doing science on, on African culture as if they were bugs under a microscope or something. Um, and I, I, knew I, had, I knew I had good intentions, but I didn't really have a good answer for what they were saying. So, you know, in, in some ways, when, when you encounter those kinds of barriers, it just firms your resolve to, to you know, in the future, I'm, I'm going to uh, actually do something that does help these folks with this, this kind of knowledge. So, uh, it's all good. This is a project that was done by uh, Xavier Vialta, a um, Spanish architect who was working in uh, Ethiopia. And what he's done is uh, take the idea of African fractals and then use that as a basis for creating uh, different types of architecture. So this is a, a, a big uh, building here that's actually a shopping center. But because he's perforated it with this uh, fractal enclosure, um, you get a, a, a nice breeze going through there, so it actually lowers their air conditioning bill. Um, this is a school that's laid out in a fractal pattern, um, also in, in uh, nor Northern Africa. And uh, he's arranged it so there are all these little uh, 
kind of nooks and, and, and uh, little places where you can hang out with friends. He's got um, uh, the grass growing up on the roof, which cools the, both, both cools the interior and it makes the roof available for uh, uh, little celebrations and things. So he's uh, uh, used that fractal architecture both as a way of, of bringing traditional culture into the, uh, into the design process, but also as a way of looking at the environmental aspects and the social aspects of the, uh, of the buildings. So, so I, I, I think uh, you know, if, if I was going to pick a, a sort of future path for ethnomathematics and ethnocomputing, I would say it's in these kinds of collaborations with other disciplines like uh, architecture or robotics or, or who knows what. Um, yes, I was, I was in uh, South Africa this summer. We usually go to Ghana, but um, with the Ebola risks, uh, my university forbid us from going anywhere in West Africa. So we ended up going to South Africa and um, had a great time working in uh, one of the, um, the townships. Uh, so, you know, South Africa used to be uh, governed by apartheid, and so blacks and whites had to live in completely different areas. Blacks could not vote. Uh, they lived in, in pretty extreme poverty. And even now that apartheid is over, there's, there's still a big transition period where, where folks are, are trying to figure out um, how these townships can sort of um, uh, uh, undergo some kind of development process. And so a lot of the folks in the township were um, doing urban agriculture. They had these little plots, little gardens uh, scattered around in, in vacant lots mm -hmm. and so on. So I was working with some students um, trying to figure out what sorts of needs that they had and trying to see if we had um, any kind of innovation that could contribute. Um, one of the things we found was that the, the folks in the uh, COSA culture, um, and to pronounce that correctly it would be COSA, um, they were doing a lot of bead work and so that fit nicely into the ethnocomputing, ethnomathematics mm -hmm. uh, project. And, um, it also uh, fit into the solar because if you have uh, enough heat, you can melt glass. So we're now working on a project to um, take you know broken glass, broken bottles you find around the, s the street, um, and then use solar energy to convert that into glass beads or, or glass rings, um, and then maybe even use ethnomathematics or ethnocomputing um, to to uh, lay out some designs and use those designs in the in the school and so on. So it's really. Um, trying to network together these different resources that are sort of already there, but they're nascent. They're, 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 they're not really well, um, well defined or, or uh, they're, they're not um, kind of flowing through the culture. They're, they're not at a point where that resource can be used in many different ways. Um, and then use ethnomathematics or ethnocomputing to sort of translate that into forms that can be used in many different ways. Um, so rather than uh, a socialist uh, perspective where you try to do things from the top down, we call it generative justice, trying to um, uh, help create social justice from the bottom up. Okay, so here's a, a little example of, of uh, history of, of STEM. So I've got a, a quote here from 1845. The white slaver has debased his nature and violates every best instinct of feeling by making slave of his fellow black. Um, so I always ask my students, you know, was that Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, or Sojourner Truth? Um, and it turns out that's a quote from Charles Darwin. So when I, whenever you mention Charles Darwin, people think, well, he talked about primitive organisms, and so he was probably racist. But just the opposite. His family was deeply involved in the abolitionist movement. In fact, his grandfather um, was a founder of, of the uh, British Abolitionist Society. Um, his uncle had entered Parliament on an abolitionist platform. Um, when when uh, he was in college, he said, you know, there was only one teacher that I, I really respected and, and enjoyed, and that happened to be the only black teacher at his college. So um, he had this abolitionist background, but the um, theories of biology at his time period, um, a lot of them were quite racist. So they claimed that there were separate origins for humans, that there was a black Adam and Eve, and a white Adam and Eve, and an Asian Adam and Eve. Um, and so Darwin, in coming up with his theory of evolution, was essentially coming up with an anti-racist theory of how humans came to be, that we were actually all from the same uh, family tree, and only very recently did that diverge into these different skin colors. Um, so it's a great example, I think, 
of how uh, a scientist can use um, their political thinking, thinking in, in terms of social justice, as a, as, a, as a kind of microscope, as a way to look more closely at the natural world and try to figure out what's going on. And Darwin realized that um, these very racist biologists who are in collusion with uh, slave plantations, um, that these folks were, of course, coming up with a biological theory that would help back up the political theory that made slavery legal. Um, and that in doing uh, the opposite, in, in coming up with this counter theory, that he was going to be able to, um, uh, to, 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 to uh, help out the folks who were against uh, slavery. So that's, a, that's an example from the history of biology, but there are plenty of examples from uh, history of mathematics as well. Um, if you look at uh, 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 graphs, um, different kinds of graphs, one of them is called the um, polar coordinate graph. Um, and so instead of doing these little histograms that do things vertically, um, it radiates out from the center. Um, the polar coordinate graph was invented by a mathematician named Florence Nightingale. And most folks, if you ask who is Florence Nightingale, will say, she was a nurse. Um, and it's true, she was a nurse, um, but she also studied with James Sylvester, who was one of the, the preeminent mathematicians in England at the time. Um, she was, she was uh, very adept in mathematics, and when she wanted to show that there weren't enough hospitals, she was up against folks like um, Francis Galton, who was the cousin of Charles Darwin. Um, Galton happened to be a, a, a racist and elitist. He, he invented the word eugenics to describe how we should be uh, filtering out the bad genes from the good genes. And he felt that rich people were rich because they had better genes than poor people. So his explanation for why so many poor people were dying in these ghettos was that they had bad genes. And so they were more susceptible to disease than his white, wealthy compatriots. Florence Nightingale, who had experience uh, in medical treatment, realized that wasn't the case, that people were dying because there weren't any hospitals in the area. They couldn't get to medical treatment. Um, and so she invented that polar uh, graph as a way to um, demonstrate the, the uh, unnecessary deaths as, as she termed it. Um, another example would be uh, uh, Benjamin Banneker, who was an um, uh, early uh, African-American man of science. And uh, he did the uh, survey for, for Washington, D.C. Um, but he also did some interesting writing about mathematics during the, the time period. And uh, if you look at, at the, the kinds of mathematical thinking and geometrical thinking that he was doing, um, some of that was coming from his African heritage. So there was a, a, an interesting case there of, of a kind of retention of African culture through a, a sort of mathematical lens. Um, so lots of wonderful places for folks to explore that intersection between cultural history and, and mathematical history. Sure. Um, so if you, if you want to um, change the world, then you need the proper tools to do so. And so from my point of view, getting a degree is, is just getting yourself some of those tools. Um, I think there's, there's other pathways. If you decide that um, I don't want to go on to graduate school and, and get a, a doctoral degree, I want to just stick with my undergraduate degree. Um, or even if you just decide, you know, after high school, I think I want to learn a trade. I want to be uh, a welder who, who knows how to change metal. Um, I want to be an electrician or a plumber. Those folks can, can uh, take a revolutionary perspective on things, too. Uh, there's lots of ways people can use their, uh, their hand skills and not just their, their brain skills. Um, but for me, you know, I'm, I'm a nerd. I mean, I, I'm, I really spent a lot of time geeking out about this stuff. Uh, and so I, I thought it was a, it was a way of uh, bringing the kind of change I want to see in the world together with the, the tools that I'm good at, which is uh, talking and, and writing software and, and so on. Sometimes I think you have to just take it on the nose and uh, get a bad grade and, 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 and just say, well, you know, that, that I learned something about my limits in, in doing so. So, um, for example, when I was in college, I wanted to learn lots of different kinds of uh, mathematics and uh, information technology. Um, so, I, for example, I took a course in um, theoretical computer science, computational theory. Um, without any of the prerequisites to do so, because 
only the computer science majors could get the prerequisites, and that wasn't my major. And, you know, I got a B in the class, and I, I felt pretty proud of that. I, I thought, hey, you know, that's a, a decent grade, and, and uh, wasn't the top grade in the class, but it wasn't the bottom one either. And, and in theory, I shouldn't have been able to take the class at all. So I, I, I think, uh, you know, you sort of need to separate out the kinds of things that people are, are ticking off little check marks for and making brownie points about from the kind of person that you want to be and the kind of things you want to do in the world. Absolutely, I would. Um, and I am often asked by a student who says, I love art, but I'm pretty good at math, or I love drama, but I'm also pretty good at computing, and I can't decide which thing to, to major in. Um, I always tell them, take the sciencey one. Take the mathematics, the computing, the engineering, whatever it is, because it's easier to swim downstream than it is to swim upstream. If you've got that computer science degree, you can then become an artist, no problem. If you're an artist, and then you say, I think for graduate school, I want computer science, it's going to be a huge struggle for you. So, um, you know, tackle the, 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 the ones that are um, sort of quantitative and technical before um, you take the ones that uh, are more qualitative and, and expressive, if, if both of those options are open to you. Um, you know, in, in the, uh, the animal world, you have some animals that are herbivores and some animals that are carnivores. But I'm an omnivore. Um, and I think often students don't realize that that's an option for them, that you can sort of be omnivorous with the world and just kind of, you know, pick up interesting tools like computing and, and mathematics and, and biology and, and uh, uh, whatever you're sort of interested in and, and explore those tools. Uh, everything else will figure itself out. Um, you just need the, the tool acquisition phase of your, of your life to uh, enable you to really explore your, your options. Okay, again, thank you so much for your time today. Appreciate it. My pleasure.